And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. A joint venture of the National Film Boards of Germany and Canada, The Whale and the Raven follows the people of the Kitimat Fjord system who are concerned about the impact of all tanker traffic on whales. We begin today's Open Connection with one of the directors of the Douglas Channel Watch, Patricia Lang. Well, the filmmaker that came from Germany wanted to meet with some people from Kitimat just to get a sense of maybe what she might be able to think are our issues here. And um, she, uh, because I'm also of German background, uh, we formed a connection. And um, so, yeah, I, I was just sort of a little bit involved in the background of the film. And then somehow I ended up being in the film just a tiny bit. Um, and yeah, it was really interesting to see how they make films and all the work that's involved. Uh, it was quite impressive. <laughs> I think our group, uh, it was formed at the time of a bunch of concerned kind of citizens, long time, older group of community members. And um, they were opposed to any oil tanker traffic on the North Coast. And in fact, the filmmaker originally was interested in that whole story, but it takes a long time for a film to be approved because this was a, um, a German and uh, Canadian National Film Board combined production. So by the time it was approved, the Enbridge had been killed. And so she came because she still really wanted to tell the story of the whales and, um, you know, use that footage as a way to promote uh, the understanding of what's going on out here. Because so few people get out on the ocean. And, you know, I grew up here and I've hardly ever been out there until recent years. And it was really being out there that for most of us in our group, that made us just fall in love with um, the marine environment and realize what a precious jewel is and how few people are here to even see it or talk about it or take care of it. And our plan was to screen it in each community in the North uh, in March last year, and then it fell through. So this is kind of this virtual screening is just is finally really a chance for us to share with the northerners no what it is that's going on in, whales in the ocean very, here in Douglas Channel. With each other. Now, uh, I was able to see a couple of snippets about it. And there was one thing that was kind of interesting. It was talking about um, uh, um, whales kind of singing to each other in the channel. Um, yeah. It was really surprising. Um, do, were you able to experience that? Well, yes, because Janie Ray, one of the two subjects of the film, she's a biologist, researcher. She, their big thing is to put these underwater hydrophones in all around uh, prominent channels where the whales travel. And I was on, and they're land-based, so she's got them all hooked into her computers in the lab on, Gil, on um, Finn Island. And so I was in the lab for the first time when I heard the whales right, so passing important. right by in and front of us. Whale and we could hear what they There's were singing to one another, you know. And then I could, I also saw them bubble net feeding where they go in a circle and one whale makes a specific call for them to circle, circle, circle. Just when it's time to get to the surface, that whale changes its call. And you know they're about to pop out and surprise you. So it's really fascinating. There's so little known about them. And this research in our area is, is really um, groundbreaking. <laughs> yeah, so it's really neat. One of the last shots in the film, when the credits are running, uh, when I first saw it in Vancouver, the, the North American screening of the film, nobody even moved during the whole credits. Nobody got up because that 
that scene of these killer whales from a drone, it was just magical. And I think we, you know, whales are very smart and they have their own way of society. But, you know, the connection to them, you can, it's, it's amazing. It's very, um, a deep connection. Whenever I've met anyone that's seen the whales, they really like fall in love with the idea of a whale and wanting to see them more. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. Formed in 2007, the Douglas Channel's Watch mission is to protect the environmental integrity of the Douglas Channel and its watershed for present and future generations. It's just one of the local organizations hosting a virtual screening of the whale and the raven. Let us return to the conversation with Patricia Langs. It, unfortunately, it's only a temporary measure, like the oil tanker moratorium. Uh, they want to review that every five years. And in fact, just this week in the House of Commons, there's a private member's bill by the, uh, from a Conservative Party member trying to overturn that act. Uh, I haven't actually seen what the vote was in the House, but people are trying still to chip away at this moratorium and wanting you know, to get their oil to the coast. Uh, but I don't think the people of BC who live along the coast, uh, we treasure the coast and we will all, I think, stand up very seriously against any of those kind of moves. Hmm. I, I'm sort of in it for life. I'll be there trying to protect the coast. No, I'm not against development, but I think we we see what's there and we are for the this really unique ecosystem and environment. Like there's a few things that tanker traffic affects when it comes to marine mammals. And that includes, you know, sea lions and seals and, and other creatures besides the bigger mammals. And that's, it can be the collision, you know, ships collision. Humpback whales um, are, are sort of notorious for not uh, being able to notice a, a ship coming and getting hit, ship strike. Uh, half the whales on the BC coast have some kind of mark of a ship strike, you know, small or, or larger propeller blade uh, scar, you know, it's a really serious problem. And then there's also the like fin whales, their uh, action is to go up right in front of moving boats. It's, it's just part of their way of whatever they're doing. So, um, but the real big issue is really the, the noise of the tankers because the noise of the propeller underwater disturbs the ability for whales to communicate. And so you can hear it on the film where the, um, the, they're listening to whales and then suddenly a tanker comes kind of around a, a corner and uh, it's shocking what you can hear underwater through those hydrophones. So like ship's noise is probably the number one worry of the researchers in this area because there's hundreds and hundreds of whales coming back, almost growing exponentially in their population. So, you know, all these whales are feeding and it's like a giant uh, food basket here. But, you know, if there's more and more tankers, it's gonna be, there'll be a lot of worries about that. So, and then, so it's the collisions and then it's the noise and the disturbance of the uh, shore even from the huge tankers, which um, which would have been really serious from the oil tanker, let alone, of course, the contamination if there were a spill. So technology is being improved for tankers all the time. There's some regulation um, <clears throat> for tanker tankers to have a whale watch person on board. There's speed regulations for tankers. So there's some measures, but like for example, at the place where um, the majority of the whales feed that come back to this area, 
it's like the main pathway for all tankers as well. And so it's that conflict between what human beings want and or need and the, the, the environment that, you know, this film brings it to light. But the main thing about the film is it's just, you know, it's, it's stunning in its uh, photography and storytelling ability for people to get to know whales. What I've noticed is a lot of the people who are involved in this film or who um, are engaged in the environmental battle are people who've experienced, you know, a, a moment out on the Douglas Channel of observing whales and seeing just another whole world that we're not used to just driving down the highway. And that magical transformation, I think, is just the, what we hope that people will feel when they see the film, that they'll get a grasp of just how magnificent the whale population is and how, you know, there's no real way to place a value on whales as compared to, you know, economic development. But, you know, I, I say, what is the value of keeping these, you know, uh, animal populations alive? And there's, it's, it's priceless if you think about the future of our planet. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Brought to you by Terrace Hospice Society. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. The GitGat Guardian Program is part of the GitGat Nation Stewardship Programs to strengthen knowledge of their territory and to enable sound conservation and resource management decisions. This includes understanding how to protect the rare wildlife found in their territory. Let us return the conversation with Nicole Robinson of Hartley Bay. I'm from Hartley Bay, GitGat First Nations. I am part of the Gunhada Clan, the Raven Clan from the House of Wee High West. Now, um, in this uh, video, uh, Whale and Raving, um, they uh, touch on something that we, we see, and that's, um, it's called the, the GitGat Guardians. Um, are you part of the organization? Yes, I am. I've been uh, seasonal employment with them for the last six years and now a full-time permanent employee. In 2006, there was the um, Queen of the North had ran aground near one of our um, very abundant uh, clam harvesting areas. And that was a big impact on the community. Like people were quite concerned for years of the effects and, you know, the, the long-term impact it would have on our food resources. Has that area recovered yet? Yes, we, we, we harvest there. I mean, like every year, in most communities, you have to watch for the biotoxin levels and those are monitored actually by the guardian watchmen. They go out and take samples, um, I believe weekly and they send it out for testing. And then our um, science director puts out uh, um, the posting of the biotoxin levels and, and people monitor. Plus we have like, um, I believe our ancestors like, you know, and elders knew how to test for, for if they were I guess they call it hot or not, and when to eat. So, but they've been, they're harvesting there again. Actually, the Guardian Watchman program um, harvested clams and took to our members that live um, in Prince Rupert and then handed out to our community here. Uh, I guess the whales are ID'd by their tail fins. Why is that? So every humpback whale, you could see in a poster behind me here, every humpback whale their fingerprint is what we call their trailing edge and their flukes. So no two flukes are the same. They're all, they're all different and it, yeah. And they're, they're identified in three different categories, um, X, Y, and Z. So the X meaning they're predominantly black flukes. 
um, why is uh, white and black mixture flukes and Z flukes are um, mostly white. And why is that important to identify these whales that come into the area? It gives us a, a, a count of how many are in the area, like their numbers. Um, so we know who's, who's returning, um, who hasn't returned, um, and just to share our information with others. Um, I guess this identification really came in uh, or was really important. Could you tell me about the um, time when you sat down with another researcher and you kind of were going through your, your iPads and kind of identify a, a whale? Oh yeah, there's a deceased humpback whale that um, when we were working in what we call our out camp, uh, we were working out there and received a phone call from a lodge that was nearby of a floating whale. So we went out and we sat down to um, figure out if it was one of the regulars in the area. It was not, we couldn't, we couldn't ID it, um, which is happy, but sad to know that, that, you know, a newcomer was found dead. Uh, networking with other organizations, um, very important. Oh yes. So, so we work in partnership with the North Coast Cetaceous Society um, in the documentary January. We have a great working partnership with her and um, also we share some of our data like personal and work data with um, the Department of Fishery and Oceans Marine Mammal Unit. That the work that Janie is doing out at um, Finn Island is quite important and um, like through social media myself included of sharing um, whale stuff that I just like to stress the importance of giving them their space, you know, and, and how important it is to keep the distance and to follow BC's guidelines of, of people keeping their distance from um, the marine life. You can watch them from afar. If they come to you, then you're fortunate, lucky. If not, just, just give them space and, you know, enjoy them from afar. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Brought to you by Terrace Hospice Society. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Roy Henry Vickers is known around the world for his unique artistic style marked by clean lines, vivid colors, and natural themes drawn from the rugged beauty of the west coast of British Columbia. In this final segment of Open Connection, we begin with a short clip from The Whale and the Raven. The story I'm going to tell you about that place, nobody has heard here for a long time. A long, long time ago, there were some men who went down to Luxail to their gathering food grounds. When they got to Luxail, they were really tired. They just took their anchor and they dropped it over the side. In the old days when we drop an anchor overboard, we just say a little prayer and we lower the anchor down gently so it doesn't hurt anything. Well, these people were so tired, they just threw it overboard. They didn't say anything. Boom, it landed on the roof of the chief of the orca. The roof shook and the chief said, what is happening up there? So the whole coast is, is very delicate. And all it takes is one tanker to go down somewhere and we have a, an environmental disaster. Just from the fuel in the boat, let alone what the boat's carrying. Everybody waits for zero tides to go and get clams and cockles. So they're part of the, uh, the a staple winter diet. So when a diesel spill happens just from the fuel tanks of a tugboat, it destroys entire clam beds. And then here, and again, we're talking about uh, sea gardens. I don't know if you know about sea gardens, 
there, uh, there's a book called So You Wanted to Visit a Sea Garden that I just finished. And this isn't a plug for the book, but it's, a, I guess it is. But it's about something that very few of us on the coast know. And these uh, gardens are areas of beach that I always, where, where there are rock walls, sometimes three, four feet high, that go all the way along the beach right at the low tide mark the zero tide line. And I always thought these rock walls were uh, fish weirs for catching fish. And then on my trip to uh, Whale Channel, realized, well, there's no creek here. What, what, what is, what is, why is this rock wall here? And then I find out years later that uh, they're clam gardens, they're, they're manicured beaches where rocks have been moved all the way down to the tide line to, to facilitate breeding of clams and cockles. And they're thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. I guess the whale songs kind of um, really go out there because there's no noise underwater. It's kind of right. surprising. It's incredible. And the big whales, they, they speak on a on a level that we can't hear, it's so low, but their their vocals will travel across the ocean. So they can communicate like we can cannot even imagine. Well, now we can with technology, but they've been doing that for forever. And so the other big thing about uh, tanker traffic, eight foot propellers, and they're churning the water and making all kinds of noise, and the sonar blips that are being sent down to check the depth of the water, they're going all the time while a tanker is moving. So the very presence of the tanker with the noise of the propellers and the sonar would be such a noise contamination under the ocean, whales couldn't communicate. Do you feel that this, this uh, documentary will help raise awareness to, to those individuals who haven't had the opportunity it's a powerful statement by people who have an intimate relationship with the land and the sea. And, and it's presented in a, in a very, very strong way to make an impression on the viewer. So yes, it's already made a difference, but hopefully it will make more. To me, success is being happy with your life, living in a place that you love to live in. And it doesn't matter how much money you make, it doesn't matter what sort of a home you have, as long as you have a covering over your head, food in your belly, uh, and a, a way to enjoy the land, you are rich. And so for me, the message is, we as a human race must come back to an intimate relationship with the earth. And to do that, we have to know ourselves and we have to know some scientific facts. And our, our people of the Northwest Coast say this all the time. We are our ancestors. Their DNA flows through the blood in our veins. They're part of us. They're part of the land. So we are part of the land. So what we do to the land, we do to ourselves. What we do to the sea, we do to ourselves. It's a very important message and, and, and I hope more people come to understand this. When they do, we will have more people who have a passion to protect the environment. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictel. Thank you.